record and okay i'm nervous <laughs> are you recording as well should i or not yeah, yeah. i will record yeah, yeah, yeah. Re yeah I on will your record, record button Are you recording? Yes, I'm recording. You're recording? It says there's a small button on the left, a small button that says recording. Yeah, it is recording in my left corner. Uh, in your left corner, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, hopefully one recording will survive. We'll see. <laughs> Sometimes Zoom is not very reliable when it comes to recording. That's why I personally use WebEx. Okay, okay. okay go. So Okay, so welcome then everyone and today we've got a special guest. Some of you may know him, some of you may not. That's why I would like to introduce him. Uh, Sam Vaknin, uh, he's narcissist, psychopath and abuse YouTube channel, has more than 32.1 million um, views and 145,000 subscribers. So, subscribe, oh my God, sorry, subscribers. Congratulations, it's, it's impressed. Uh, Sam is visiting professor of psychology in Southern Federal University, Rostov on Dan, Russia. Uh, he's also professor of finance and psychology in Center for International Advanced and Professional Studies, founder, healthcare committee, Ministry of Health, Republic of Macedonia. Also, uh, Sam is the author of uh, malignant self-love narcissist revisited uh, and if I remember you wrote like more than 3,000 more books I think if I remember it's so more like, well, more like, 60, well but Sam, more like 60 but I'm still young <laughs> I'm really happy to have you here uh, today you. Uh, today we'll be talking about um, narcissist personality disorder and dependent personality disorder and especially about dynamic between these two personalities and uh, so so yes um one more time welcome Sam, and thank you for thank you for having me yeah um so my A first pleasure. question maybe it's like we can start from um your point of view about narcissist personality disorder and dependent personality disorder like in a perspective that it's two sides of the same coin if you could uh, say what how how you see uh, this perspective and maybe even referring to childhood uh, so mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't say two sides of the same coin, but I would say that both of them um, are solutions that the child chooses when the child is confronted with a dysfunctional family, with abuse, with trauma, with what Andre Green called the dead mother, a mother who is selfish, depressed, emotionally unavailable, a mother who who, yeah. makes the, who makes the child parentify her, a mother who instrumentalizes the child, uses the child to realize her dreams and wishes, mm -hmm. a mother, of course, or parents who abuse the child classically, physically, verbally, psychologically, and so on. I'm saying mother because in the critical years, which are zero to probably four, the, what we call the formative years, it is the mother that has 90% of the influence. It is the mother that dictates the developmental trajectory of the child. The father comes much later. The father comes in as a socialization ag agent, as a representative of society. The father also contributes very greatly to gender differentiation. The father also teaches the child skills, survival skills, social skills. The father is a very important figure. I'm not underestimating the father's contribution or the father's ability to damage the psychology of the child. But that comes, that comes much later. Much, much earlier, it's the mother and almost exclusively the mother. When the mother is dysfunctional, the child has several options. And two of these options are narcissism or codependency, or what we call dependent personality disorder. The child can emulate the abuser, can internalize the abuser, can imitate the abuser. 
The child can make a kind of internal, mostly unconscious decision that it's better to be the abuser than the victim. And then the child tries to, to become an abuser and succeeds, <laughs> then becomes a narcissist. The alternative is, of course, for the child to merge, to merge with a frustrating object, to fuse with the mother, to become one with the mother, to merge or to fuse, and in this sense, to assimilate the mother, to assimilate the bad object, and thereby to neutralize, to render the bad, bad object innocuous, not frightening, not threatening. Because if the bad object is part of you, then it gives you the illusion of control. And indeed, dependent personality disorder or codependency is a disorder of control. It's the, it's the use of various behavioral tactics, such as clinging, such as neediness, in order to control the partner. Now, in both cases, in narcissism and in codependency, the, the person, the patient, the client, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, the person with the disorder needs the intimate partner, not only physically, but needs the intimate partner psychologically. The intimate partner fulfills ego functions, fulfills internal functions. The narcissist uses the intimate partner to regulate his sense of self-worth, uses the intimate partner to gain uh, access to reality, to gain what we call reality testing, uses the intimate partner for a variety of functions that are usually internal functions, usually functions that are not dependent on other people. The narcissist depends on other people and more specifically on his intimate partner. Similarly, the codependent. The codependent needs her intimate partner so as to regulate her internal environment. In both these cases, and of course in borderline, there is a dysregulated, chaotic, chaotic environment, an environment that is labile, up and down, environment that's unpredictable. The situation with borderline is so bad that in the last 15 years, we are reconceiving of borderline. We're beginning to consider borderline personality disorder as a form of multiple personality, as a form of dissociative identity disorder. Because in borderline personality disorder, we have self states, several states of self, which are very, very distinct from one another. Similarly, in narcissism, we have at least two self states. We have yeah. the true self and the false self. These are distinct. They have nothing in common whatsoever. They are actually kind of enemies. They're hostile to each other. So we have at least two, uh, I wouldn't say personalities, but self-states, distinguishable self-states. And, and so we see that this entire family of disorders, formerly known as cluster B personality disorders or erratic or dramatic personality disorders, we are beginning to see that they have common etiology, common causation, common, common developmental pathway or trajectory. First of all, all these disorders are post-traumatic conditions. We can reconceive of all these disorders not as personality disorder, but as forms of complex trauma. So we can reconceive of these disorders as forms of CPTSD. Indeed, in recent studies, we are discovering that victims of CPTSD, for example, victims of narcissistic abuse, victims of domestic violence, victims of emotional abuse, victims of these types of abuse, they are psychodynamically indistinguishable from people with borderline personality disorder. CPTSD, CPTSD and borderline personality disorder are literally indistinguishable. So we are beginning to rethink these disorders as combination, post-trauma and dissociation. So there was a trauma, it created a post-traumatic condition. This condition was so severe, the child couldn't cope with it. So the child broke to pieces. The child was shattered like a Ming, like a Ming vase, shattered to pieces. 
Each piece. Do you mean fragmentation? There was there was a personality fragmentation. There was no personality at age four, or even at age nine. There is still no what Jung calls constellated self. Yeah. But there were there were the rudiments of personality self, the rudiments of self, and they broke to pieces. Mm -hmm. And these pieces are what we call the self states. In other words, to summarize, I regard all these personality disorders as forms of dissociative multiple uh, dissociative post-traumatic multiple personality disorders. I think we need to reconceive of them that way. And then we can become a lot more efficient in administering therapy. Mm -hmm. Yes, I completely agree with what you said, especially uh, when you compare borderline and um, CPTSD. I think it's a lot of mistakes, uh, especially from psychologists, uh, that they, for example, give someone diagnose that uh, the person has a borderline. And to be honest, it's not true because it's just just it's. CPTSD, right? So I, I completely agree with just what you what you said. But, if I um, if I may add one one thing. Yeah, sure. sure. Yes, please. It is this attempt to reconceive of these personality disorders and to connect them to trauma and to connect them to dissociation. Mm -hmm. This attempt is part of a much bigger war, much mm -hmm. bigger battle. In the 19th century when the modern discipline of psychology had been established, because psychology has been around for 4,000 years, but the modern discipline, let's say the German discipline, because psychology started as experimental science in laboratory, went, went and others, yes? So when psychology started in Germany, in Austria, later in the United States, um, it was heavily influenced by the ethos of individualism at that time was the beginning of the capitalist phase of individualism free enterprise private enterprise profits the individual as a risk risk taker people immigrated there was huge immigration so when you immigrate you're an individual you break apart from your community you break apart from your country from your language you become total atom individual so there was an ethos there was a kind of spirit, ambience, atmosphere of individualism. And of course, modern psychology started as the science of the individual. Mm -hmm. What has happened since the 60s? We are beginning to reconceive of modern psychology, not as the science of the individual, but as the science of interpersonal relationships. You see Freud, for example, Freud wrote about individuals. It's very difficult to find in Freud's writing anything about relationships. For Freud's, Freud's trilateral model is 99% is about the individual and 1% about society. Society is kind of abstract, afterthought, is not really there. Mm -hmm. Same with Jung, of course. Although Jung tried to compromise somehow by introducing the collective unconscious, but the collective unconscious is so bizarre, so non-scientific, so not open to study and experimentation, it might as well be occult, you know. So until the 60s, because Jung died in the 60s, yes, until the 60s, it was all about the individual. And then we started to shift. We started to realize that the individual is an abstraction and not a useful abstraction not abstraction but obstruction something that makes it very difficult for us to understand how humans function mm -hmm. today we have emphasis on relationships interaction dynamics. groups dynamics mm -hmm. and so on this so on. the new disorders the new disorders because narcissistic personality disorder first appeared in 1980, it's a very new disorder. The yeah. first time NPD was mentioned was in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, edition three, 1980. That's new. In terms of history, it's new. Borderline, the first serious attempt to study borderline was in the 70s. 
and the most serious attempt was with Otto Kernberg in 1975. That's also new. I was already a teenager at the time. I was alive. Okay, I'm a dinosaur, but you know. So these are new disorders. And if you look at these disorders, they are social disorders. Narcissistic personality disorder is not an individual's disorder, but it's a disorder of how individual relates to other people. The criteria are interrelational, interpersonal. One of the main criteria of narcissistic personality disorder is a lack of empathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy. There's no empathy without other people. Another criteria that the narcissist is exploitative. There's no exploitation without other people. Another criterion is the narcissist is envious. There's no envy without other people. Same with the borderline. If you look at the diagnostic criteria in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and especially so in the fifth edition, 2013, just mm -hmm. published, mm -hmm. you will see that these are not disorders of the self. They are not disorders of the individual. They are disorders of how the individual functions within networks of other people, within communities, within families, within romantic relationships, within. So intimacy is a crucial determinant. Empathy, envy, negative emotionality, reactance, in other words, defiance, lack of impulse control in relation to other people exploitation, harming and hurting other people. All these are critical facets of these disorders. Now, Freud was the first to describe narcissism, but he didn't describe it as we understand it today. He described it as a reaction of the individual as a baby. His work in 1914 was about baby narcissism. He called it primary narcissism. That's not the narcissism we are talking about today. Not the same. Yes, I agree because um, he was writing about the stage that everyone uh, is going through, right? And it's like a let's say good narcissist, right? And today okay. we are talking about uh, yeah. completely different uh, things, like like you said, about dynamics between uh, personalities. And yes, but if we are talking about dynamics, then. Um, I would like to stop here and ask you about because we've got a lot of experts especially on youtube uh, that they showing this dynamic between uh, narcissists and codependents uh, as a magnet and i can't agree with uh, with this point of view because then i'm asking myself like okay if it's magnet where is the responsibility uh, right so what do you think about that how you see this there is not a single expert on YouTube. All the real experts in narcissism and codependency are not on YouTube. You cannot find them on YouTube. The yeah, leading yeah. experts, and, the leading yeah. experts on narcissism today are John John Twenge, Keith Campbell, even Kernberg was alive. Me, uh, Theodore Millen was a, when he was alive. There was YouTube already, and so on. Similarly, the leading experts on codependency are um, Linehan and others these names the real experts you will not find them on youtube the people you find on youtube are not experts they have published nothing in the field they don't teach these subjects in their own universities if they are in any university at all so i would use the word experts very judiciously i have yet to come across a single expert online one experts exactly so this let's put this aside yeah. Now, I think the source of the confusion is this. The narcissist is indiscriminate. The narcissist is promiscuous in the sense mm -hmm. that the narcissist doesn't care who you are, mm -hmm. what you are, what is your identity, what are your traits, what are your qualities. What are your preferences, your dreams and wishes, etc.? Because for the narcissist, you don't exist. So the narcissist doesn't care if you are codependent at all. He doesn't care if you have empathy or don't have empathy. 
He doesn't care if you're a psychopath. He doesn't care if you're another narcissist. He doesn't care about anything whatsoever. He doesn't care even to a large extent how you look. He doesn't care. Okay. He cares about one thing only. He's one track minded. He's totally goal oriented. And that's why we think that there is a lot of overlap between psychopathy and narcissism because both are goal oriented. Mm -hmm. So the narcissist's goal is narcissistic supply. And that's the only thing, the only thing that attracts you to, attracts him to you or repels him from you. He gauges, he has something called, called that I called, called empathy. He scans you, he scans like a scanner. Mm -hmm. and he says, this girl, this woman, this man, mm -hmm. this object, this object, this car, this smartphone, this laptop, they can give me narcissistic supply. From that moment, the narcissist begins to invest emotionally in that woman, in that man, and in that object. Cathexis, emotional investment in narcissism, is indiscriminate and promiscuous in the sense that there is no there are no standards there are no criteria and there are no preferences that's the narcissistic side on the other side it is true that certain psychological profiles would tend to gravitate to narcissists would tend to be more attracted to narcissists they include codependents borderlines other people, for example, bipolars in the manic phase would be attracted to narcissists. Depressives, depressives, people with depressive illnesses. So there are whole groups of people with mental problems, with mental issues, who would be inexorably, powerfully, irresistibly attracted to the narcissist. That part is true. But it is not reciprocal. Because I read online a lot of nonsense by these so-called experts, and most of what they say, regrettably, is nonsense, but a lot of nonsense that it is the narcissist who prefers women who are codependent or empathic. No, that is not true. It is true that they end up together. Now, the first one real scholar who does not have a YouTube channel, of course, because she is a real scholar, she's also a very good personal friend of mine, the first one to describe the attraction between borderlines and narcissists was a woman called Joanne Lachkar. And Joanne Lachkar wrote the seminal book about this attraction and about this type of couple, Narcissist Borderline Couple. That's the title of the book, Narcissistic Borderline Couple. And she was the first to describe it in the 80s, 10 years before I started my work. She described, she described I started my work in 1995. I'm a pioneer, and I coined the phrase narcissistic abuse. I invented this phrase. But she preceded me. She preceded me by at least 10 years. And she described the dynamic between narcissists and borderlines, narcissists and later codependents, and so on. And what she had described is that the two parties fulfill functions, psychological functions for each other. But the truth of the matter is that the narcissist is absolutely goal oriented and he's focused on supply he's a junkie a junkie an addict drug addict he doesn't care how you look if you can give him the drug he doesn't care if you're a nice person if you can give him the heroin yeah he wants to inject he wants his drug he doesn't care if you're nice empathic borderline codependent 96 years old Tall, short, blonde, he doesn't care about any of this. The junkie cares about one thing. Do you have my fix? Do you have my heroin? If you do, I'm going to love you. I'm going to adore you. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get the heroin out of you. We must think of narcissism as an addiction. It's an addiction. So is borderline. So is codependence. Yeah. The narcissist is addicted to supply borderline is addict, addicted to regulation she uses the intimate partner to regulate and when, when she when she fears abandonment when she anticipates abandonment 
she dysregulates, she falls apart. And the codependent is, is dependent on this codependent. She's dependent by definition. These are addicts. And like all addicts, they are indiscriminate. Simply. Mm -hmm. So what you said, and I have a question about that. Um, you said that a narcissist is scanning. Uh, he's scan like a scanner, right? Uh, and you call this called empathy. Called empathy, yeah. Yes. What exactly is he looking for then? If he's not feel anything from from us, right? What is he looking for? What is the supply then for for narcissists? Yeah, empathy has three components. There is reflexive empathy. That is the empathy that the baby shows to mommy. When mommy smiles, the baby smiles. Reflexive empathy develops probably already in the womb. Because okay. babies react within the womb to mommy's moods, mommy's uh, yeah. movements and so on. This is reflexive, animals have it as well. Then there is cognitive empathy, it develops a bit later. And it's the ability to think, to see someone and then to think about that someone's condition, but you don't have any emotional reaction. Okay. One of the reasons you don't have any emotional reactions as a child, when you have cognitive empathy, is you don't have enough life experience. Mm -hmm. To develop full empathy, you need to have life experience. You need to have experienced the same condition like the other person. If I see that you are sad, and I've never been sad because I'm two years old, it's mm -hmm. difficult for me to have emotional empathy with you. Because I see that you are sad. And I can even say mommy is sad because I learned that when people cry, they are sad. It's called sad. So I can say mommy is sad. But I don't feel that mommy is sad because I'm two years old and I've never been sad. I didn't have the opportunity to be sad. So this is cognitive empathy. Much later, we have emotional empathy. And morality is the hyperstructure. So we have, based on empathy, we have morality what not to do to other people. Um, the narcissist, because the narcissist, narcissism is arrested development. The narcissist stops his development as a child. He remains a child forever. Mm -hmm. So because he remains a child forever, he's stuck in the cognitive phase. He has reflexive and cognitive, but no emotional. And when he goes through life without access to his emotions, so he never develops emotional resonance because he has no access to his positive emotions. He has no access to his positive emotions because he also has strong negative emotions. And he's afraid that if he, if he allows himself to emote, if he allows himself to feel, it will be very painful. So to avoid pain, to avoid hurt, the narcissist prefers not to feel anything, not to have any emotions, good, at least good, not to have emotions. So because he doesn't have emotions, he cannot identify with you. He cannot empathize with you emotionally. He can just understand in his cognition, in his mind, in his thinking, what is happening to you. He has seen such situations before. So if he sees that you are crying, he goes into his database like a computer and he says, oh, I have seen 36 other people crying and they told me that they are sad. So probably she said, but it has no resonance. It's like a computer would say this. But if you are sad, I can take advantage with, of you. If you're sad, if you're broken, if you're damaged, if you're afraid, if you're happy, if you're in mean, any state of mind, any of your emotions, I can leverage, I can use to take advantage of you. If you are very, very sad and broken, I can get you drunk and then get you to bed and have sex with you. If you are very uh, happy and because of that you are not very careful, I can take your money. Everything presents an opportunity to take advantage of you somehow. And of course, the narcissist doesn't want your money. He doesn't even want your sex. He wants narcissistic supply. But the psychopath, wants your money, wants your sex, wants access, wants many things, wants your property, wants many things from you. So both types, narcissists and psychopaths, they scan you, they see your weak points, your weak points, your vulnerabilities, your chinks, entry points, intrusion points. They're like a, they're like a hostile army 
And the army is, is probing the walls, the walls of the castle, where they can break through in yeah. the siege. That's called empathy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for this. Uh, it's explaining a lot. Um, but also, how then um, the relationship with narcissists affect codependent, especially codependent person, um, when she or he is with narcissists? Similar to the narcissist, the codependent doesn't really see the other person. Both of them have something something that I call I coined the term co-idealization. Mm -hmm. Co-idealization. Both of them idealize each other. Now the narcissist needs to idealize his intimate partner because his, if his intimate partner is ideal, then he is ideal. If she is the most beautiful, intelligent, amazing woman on earth, and she had chosen him, that means that he is the most amazing, intelligent man on earth. By idealizing her, is actually idealizing himself as her partner. So this is process of co-idealization. The codependent and the borderline need to idealize the narcissist in order to, to reduce anxiety. For them, idealization is an is anxiety-reducing mechanism. It's anxiolytic. So the, the borderline is terrified of abandonment. Abandonment, loss, separation. And, and she, is, she anticipates and she also mislabels and misinterprets many behaviors as rejection or as humiliation or as abandonment when they are not. So okay. she is on a constant state of alert. She is constantly stressed, anticipating the worst. We call this process catastrophizing. So the borderline catastrophizes all the time. To reduce the, and catastrophizing creates anxiety, intolerable anxiety. Now with the borderline, this anxiety creates mood swings, ups uh -huh. and downs, it's called lability. It also, this anxiety also, dysregulates her emotions because if she changes her emotions she can control her anxiety this is the way we solve dissonance for example if i am very afraid that you will abandon me one way to solve this is to say i don't really love you i don't care if you abandon me suddenly i switch from love to hate because if i hate you you cannot hurt me but if I love you, you can hurt me. So emotional dysregulation and mood lability, they are derivatives of an underlying anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. And of course, borderline is very comorbid with anxiety disorders and depression. It's well known. It's in many studies. Mm -hmm. S same with codependence. So these, women, these people, they're mostly women. These people, they anticipate the worst. They catastrophize, they misread reality, they have impaired reality testing. Everything to them is impending doom, abandonment, humiliation, rejection, disaster, breakup, loss, separation, you know, horrible. So to reduce this level, they idealize the narcissist. They say, oh, he loves me a lot. He will never leave me. Or he is like my father, daddy, daddy issues, figure, father figure. Father will never harm his daughter, will never hurt his daughter. So he is my father. He loves me unconditionally. Never mind what I do. He will never desert me. He will never abandon me. So she also is not interacting with the real person, but with the idea, with the idealized narcissist. And so we have in this kind of relationships, two interactions which have nothing in common. That the codependent interacts with an idealized version of the narcissist that has nothing to do with the narcissist. And the narcissist interacts with an idealized version of a codependent that has nothing to do with the codependent. And I call this situation shared fantasy. Mm -hmm. That's the shared fantasy. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about um, Frog Syndrome? They? Have you heard about Frog Syndrome? Frog. Which syndrome? I, I can't hear. Can you spell it? Frog. Frog, like an animal. 
F-R-O-G. Sorry? F-R-O-G. Frog, Frog syndrome. Yes, sorry. Yes, <laughs> yes. it's the... It's... Yeah, when codependent, uh, she was uh, hoping that uh, when she uh, kissed the frog, it will it will uh, turn into a prince, and it didn't, yeah. and she turned into into a frog. And yeah, there's also another variant of this that uh, you can cook a frog increased by one degree, and the frog doesn't realize until it's cooked. <laughs> yes, that's um, true. The thing is that given the right circumstances. These, mm -hmm. these relationships are very long-lived. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what we call the trauma bonding. Yeah. The, the, the trauma bonding, the essence of the trauma bonding is the emotional investment in a shared fantasy. And mm -hmm. this shared fantasy is, is very powerful and almost impossible to break because the parties are not invested in each other, but they're invested in two things. They're invested in a figment of their imagination, what mm -hmm. we call an internal object. The codependent has an internal object of the narcissist. She is interacting with the internal object, not with the narcissist. And the narcissist has what I call a snapshot. It's an internal object of the codependent and he's interacting with that. Consequently, when the parties interact with these idealized images, simultaneously they are idealizing themselves. Now that's a very crucial insight. It's very important to understand. In a shared fantasy, the two parties, let's say narcissist and borderline, narcissist and codependent, in a shared fantasy, the two parties are in love with themselves, not with each other. Mm -hmm. Let me try to explain this. Mm -hmm. I, I see you. I think that you can be my intimate partner as a narcissist, let's say. I'm a narcissist and I think you can be my intimate partner. Mm -hmm. I idealize you. I take a snapshot of you. I take a photo. Mm -hmm. I internalize this photo. It becomes an internal object. I idealize the internal object. And from that moment, I'm not interacting with you anymore. I'm interacting exclusively with internal object, which is an idealized internal object. Because this internal object is idealized, it allows me to idealize myself. In other words, it allows me to fall in love with myself. This is super, super crucial insight because both the narcissist and the codependent can, don't have self-love. They don't love themselves. They hate themselves. They loathe themselves. There's no self-love in narcissism and codependency. The only way a narcissist can experience self-love is by falling in love with an internal object, which is a part of him. Mm -hmm. So I'm using you to love myself and you are using me as a codependent to love yourself. This is the core, this is the addictive nature of trauma bonding. Trauma bonding allows both parties to finally, for the first time in life, love themselves. Allows for self-love, true self-love. This is intoxicating. It's like a drug. It's very difficult to break. Now, the mechanism that underlies trauma bonding is called intermittent reinforcement. Intermittent reinforcement is when I give you feedback, which is not stable, which is unpredictable, which is hot and cold, black and white, love and hate. Mm -hmm. I keep the environment such that you are constantly on your toes. You don't know what to expect. You are not, why is how is this part of idealization how is this part of self-love it's a power play it's a power play when i fall in love with myself as a narcissist i fall in love with my self and my self is grandiose it's omnipotent it's all-powerful it's godlike 
I need to prove it all the time using the internal object because I'm in love with the internal object. The internal object is part of me. I'm in love with the internal object. I'm in love with myself. But I need, if I'm in love with myself, I need to prove to myself that my self is real. And this self is grandiose, godlike, powerful. I need to show my power. And the only way for me to show my power is to torture you, to keep you on your toes. Mm -hmm. I need to be the only source of certainty in your life, the only source of power. I need to be the electricity utility. Without me, you die. So this is, intermittent reinforcement is actually a grandiosity enhancing behavior on the part of the narcissist. Why does the borderline accept it? She accepts it because uh, after, because, because I would say the adrenaline or dopamine rush, after each bad period, there's a good period. And it is the bad period that makes the good period look so good. We make the mistake, we think, that if we have a stable relationship where someone loves you 100% of the time, no interruptions, that's the strongest love possible. That's the strongest intimacy possible. Not true. Mm -hmm. The strongest love possible, the strongest intimacy possible, is after a period where you did not have intimacy and where you did not have love. It is the contrast that creates the potency and the power of the emotions that follows. If you didn't have love many years and then you fall in love, be believe me, it's a hundred times more intense mm -hmm. than if you had love all the time. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have intimacy and then you finally have intimacy, even with a pet, with a cat, with a dog, it's very intense, it's a very strong. And intermittent reinforcement does exactly this. It creates highs, like a drug-induced drug highs. It creates highs by creating low. The narcissist gives you a low so that you feel the high much more intensely. He is getting a sense of power by tormenting you and torturing you and keeping you on your toes and being the, the only source of certainty uh, in your life. So this gives him a sense of godlike power, allows him to continue to emotionally invest in his grandiose self. And you also want it. You also want it because you are addicted to intense emotionality. Mm -hmm. You are addicted to intense emotions. And it is not true that intermittent reinforcement is that unpredictable. It's not. I will give you the rule of intermittent reinforcement. After each bad period, there's a good period. And after each good period, there's a bad period. It's totally predictable in a way. And you keep waiting. It's like being hungry and eating, being hungry and eating. You keep waiting for this. You're addicted. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, you said that it's almost impossible to break it these dynamics um, between uh, narcissists and codependent and i totally agree um, with you i was in this kind of relationship 10 years almost and uh, and it it is like addiction I, I i completely agree with this but what how can you see this like when you can break it from your point of view these type of relationships, which are essentially trauma bonded and based on intermittent reinforcement and based on falling in love with yourself within the relationship via the agency of your intimate partner. I call it the hall of mirrors. The narcissist invites you to his hall of mirrors. When you enter the hall of mirrors, what do you see? You don't see the narcissist. You see yourself. When the narcissist love bombs you, when the narcissist grooms you, he, he, he lures you, he seduces you to come into his carnival attraction, into his hall of mirrors. You step gingerly, carefully, you step into the hall of mirrors. The minute you stepped in, you're doomed. You're finished. You're hostage. Why? Because when you start, step into the hall of mirrors, you see your idealized self. You see yourself in the mirror. Mm -hmm. It is a distorting mirror. It's not a real mirror. It's a mirror that shows you in an unrealistic light, makes you look super beautiful, amazing, intelligent, sensitive, empathic, incredible, unique, unprecedented. 
you fall in love with this. You fall in love with this. Uh -huh. you, you, and you fall in love, in essence, with the idealized image of yourself. But still, it is self-love. First time in your life, it's self-love. So to break this is very difficult because it's like asking you not to love yourself anymore. It's very difficult. And it happens usually in two cases. When the narcissist had enough of you, he begins to have difficulties to idealize you. So after some time, there is accumulation of information, accumulation of incidents, of events, of behaviors, you know, that this accumulation becomes too much. And the narcissist can ignore two, two items of information, 10 items of information, but after 10 years, there's a thousand items of information. For example, if I think you're very intelligent and then you say something stupid, I can ignore it. I can continue to idealize you, but to ignore it, I must invest energy. Uh -huh. I must repress the information that you're stupid. I must uh -huh. deny it. I must reframe it. I must ignore it. It takes a lot of, and it's called confirmation bias, it takes a lot of effort. Okay, so one case, okay, two cases. The next day, you also say something stupid. Then, after 10 years, there are a thousand incidents where you said something seriously stupid. That makes it very difficult for me to consider you as intelligent. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to idealize you anymore. Okay. After some time, the narcissist gives up the idealization and begins to see you as you truly are. And that he doesn't want. Because as you truly are, reflects on him. It makes okay. it difficult for him to idealize himself and to fall to be in love with himself. Okay. Also, it makes it difficult to, for him to maintain his grandiosity. So he switches. He switches from idealization to devaluation. And in the deval devaluation phase, is intended to help him to get rid of you. That's one way of getting out of the relationship. You may have convinced yourself that you walked out, but I have a secret and a surprise for you and for your listeners. If the narcissist doesn't want you to walk out, you will never ever walk out. It's very simple. You can think that you are the one who packed your things and left. You can think that you're the strong one, that you woke up, that you made a decision, that you are there. The narcissist wanted you to do this. He manipulated you to think that you are the initiating party. He's good in this. Psychopaths, definitely. So this is one one way. Second way is when you went through a trauma, a life crisis, something that woke you up and changed you in a way that rendered you more healthy. Uh -huh. so this could be in therapy, this could be life crisis, this could be a good friend, a good friend with great influence on you. There are many paths, pathways. We know, for example, that borderline personality disorder, um, close to 50% of people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder lose the disorder completely after age 45, spontaneously. The spontaneous healing of borderline personality disorder after age 45 in half borderlines. We know, for example, that di dialectic behavioral therapy, DBT, is very efficient with borderline. So if you go to DBT, you can get rid of borderline. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we know that the prognosis for codependents who are in therapy or codependents who develop a social safety, social network, social mm -hmm. support network, the mm -hmm. prognosis is excellent, which is precisely the reason why the narcissist isolates you, does not allow you to have family and friends. Narcissist knows this. So life helps you. And at some stage, you have changed. But you must understand this. The minute you have changed, you can no longer be idealized. Mm -hmm. If you become assertive, independent, autonomous, strong, decisive, the narcissist doesn't want you. It's not that because of that you are able to walk out. It's because the minute you become like that, the narcissist pushes you away. He doesn't want you. It's impossible to idealize you this way. You push back. He doesn't like that. He doesn't like resistance, criticism, disagreement. He doesn't want you as a, as a living thing. 
the narcissist wants to mummify you. Mm -hmm. uh, with your permission, I'll try to explain why. Why the narcissist wants you dead, mentally dead. Mm -hmm. You remember that the narcissist, when the first time he meets you, he takes a snapshot, yeah. a photo, yeah. literally a photo. He internalizes it. He also internalizes your voice. So now he has an internal object and an introject, your voice. Mm -hmm. So you are made of an internal object and an introject. Together, it's you. From that moment, he interacts with his internal objects. It is crucial for, for him to interact with his objects to allow him to idealize himself. In, in other words, it's an integral part of his grandiosity. He cannot afford to interact with, with you, really, out, out, outside, because he cannot control you. He okay. needs to control you to feel grandiose. And you cannot control a living human being. You cannot control an external object, but you can control an internal object. Okay? That's the background. Now, if I see you, let's say I'm a narcissist, you're codependent. I see you. I say, wow, she, is, she has two advantages. One, she's blonde. Second, she can give me narcissistic supply. Okay, great. I will ignore the blonde part, but she can give me supply. So she can be my intimate partner. I will... I will um, love bomb her, I will groom her, I will make her mine. This process is called acquisition. I will acquire you. But that second, I take a snapshot of you. I internalize it. And from that moment, I interact with a snapshot, not with you. Why is this a problem? Because you are a living thing. You develop, you grow, you change, you make new friends, you have a new job. You buy new books, you watch new movies, these movies make you think, these thoughts change you. You are not the snapshot. You have a life of your own, you're animated. Gradually, the differences between you and the snapshot become bigger and bigger. You diverge from the snapshot. As you diverge from the snapshot, it makes it more and more and more difficult to idealize you, more and more difficult to idealize me based on idealizing you more and more difficult to maintain my grandiosity you are challenging my grandiosity by separating from the snapshot so the more independent you are the more autonomous you are the more assertive you are the faster you divorce the snapshot and the less useful you are to me mm -hmm. i can state with absolute certainty that it is the narcissist who gets rid of the codependent. The narcissist who gets rid of the borderline. Mm -hmm. Many narcissists instinctively, automatically, or cleverly make their partner think that she had initiated the breakup, mm -hmm. that she was the one who walked away. Mm -hmm. And lately, later, the narcissist tries to hoover these partners, usually for short-term supply mm -hmm. gaps. And so because he tries to hoover them, it convinces them even more that they are the ones who walked away. Mm -hmm. But if the narcissist doesn't want you to walk away, you will not walk away. It's Bluebeard. Mm -hmm. You're in his cave. Mm -hmm. It's The narcissist is a mastermind in creating such total addiction. Even the most basic primitive narcissist, by the way. It's animalistic. It's instinctual, reflexive. It's not even, you know, especially intelligent narcissists, but even not intelligent. They create such addiction that trust you, me, by yourself, you cannot, you need the narcissist to push you away. Mm -hmm. And the more you change, the better your chances are that it will push you away. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for this one. It's, uh very important thing uh, and also I have a lot of questions from people uh, they ask him is the narcissist aware that he's a narcissist or she is a narcissist and what exactly he or she is doing a lot of people is asking uh, about that and also they ask him uh, how can they help narcissists uh, so yeah what do you think about that 
As usual, there's a lot of nonsense online, a lot of myths, and the, one of the most common myths is that narcissists are not self-aware. Mm -hmm. The truth, the truth is that all nas all narcissists are fully self-aware. Mm -hmm. They fully know who they are. They know definitely what they're doing, mm -hmm. and so on. The reason people think they are not self-aware is because the narcissist disagrees with them on how to interpret his disorder and his actions. So when the narcissist is being obnoxious, arrogant, hurtful, sadistic, aggressive, disagreeable, etc., etc., you would say, this is horrible. This is unacceptable behavior, socially and individually. This is this. Narcissist wouldn't say that. Narcissist would say that he's being efficient. Narcissists glorify and glamorize their disorder. Narcissists fully believe that what you consider a disorder is not a disorder. It's the next step in human evolution. It is what makes them superior to you. You are too stupid. Hello again. Hello. We're still recording. You're, I'm recording. You're still recording? Yes, I just, uh, I stopped, I think, but yes, I'm still recording right now uh, because I so the, the the narcissist fully realizes that he's special, that, okay. he's, un, that he's unusual, that he's idiosyncratic, or that he's eccentric. And he also, he also realizes that many people disagree with the way he is, don't like the way he is, reject him, and so on. But in his mind, people are stupid, inferior. They can't grasp that mm -hmm. narcissism is an evolutionary positive adaptation, that it endows the narcissist with advantages. Narcissists will often tell you, had I not been a narcissist, I would not have been so accomplished. I would not have been so creative. I would not have reached the top of my company or the top of politics or the, you know, I would have not been a famous surgeon. Narcissists also find many behaviors amusing. It's a psychopathic side of narcissism. They find them amusing where you don't find them amusing at all. So if they humiliate someone, they, for them, they, their sense of humor is very, <laughs> very aggressive humiliating, blunt honesty, being too honest, uh, insultingly. So, I mean, so the answer to your question is yes, narcissists are fully aware. They know what they're doing. And I can prove it to you very easily. When the narcissist goes to jail, to prison, he doesn't behave the same. If the narcissist were to behave as a narcissist in prison, he wouldn't last one night. The next morning, they would take him out in a body bag. He knows it. Suddenly, in prison, he becomes a pussycat. He's the most loving, empathic, caring person. He pays attention. He is sensitive to other people's needs. He doesn't behave aggressively. He doesn't insult and attack. He is a totally changed man overnight. Because in prison, the price for being a narcissist is your life. So, yes, these behaviors are totally conscious, because had they not been conscious, he would not have been able to change them. And they are totally deliberate. The narcissist is proud of what you consider disorder. He's proud of it. Can you help a narcissist? No, not really. It's the shortest answer you're going to get in this uh, show. Not really. Um, Therapy is, some kinds of therapies are effective in modifying some antisocial and abrasive behaviors of narcissists, but it's impossible to touch the core. Narcissism is not like cancer. It's not that you have the patient and you have the cancer. Mm -hmm. Narcissism is the patient. Narcissism is the narcissist. It's not that the narcissist has narcissism. N narcissism has the narcissist. If you take away the narcissism, there will be no one there, no one left. Narcissist, the na narcissism is not a disorder of, a, of existence, not a disorder of presence. 
Narcissism is a disorder of absence. There's no one there. It's a huge emptiness. It's a trap, open and dark trap. So you can't cure. It's meaningless to ask if you can cure narcissism because there's the assumption. When you cure something in medicine, when you cure something, there's the assumption that after you remove the disease, what is left is the patient. But in narcissism, if you remove the disease, nothing will be left. Okay, I understand. Thank you so much. Um, Yeah, I have one more question, uh, last one, but not least one. So have you got any advice to someone who just, let's say, finish a relationship with narcissists? Let's say that uh, it, it happened. Fini- you mean advice after the relationship is over? Yes, after. What's now? What's after? Yes, my main advice would be to try to understand what is wrong with you. Why you ended up in a relationship with a narcissist. It implies severe problems with boundaries, personal boundaries. It -hmm. implies internal dynamics, which are not good dynamics. They're as pathological as the narcissist dynamic. Inability Mm -hmm. to regulate emotions. Inability Mm -hmm. to control moods, labile moods. Maybe problems of impulsivity and recklessness. Maybe defiance. Maybe um, misperception of reality, impaired reality testing. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, emotional blackmail and manipulation, manipulativeness. Mm-hmm. To be needy, to be needy, to be clinging is to, to blackmail, to manipulate. These are not positive things. Maybe um, the maybe belief, a belief that you are incomplete mm-hmm. without someone else. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily a narcissist, but generally a belief that you are incomplete. So a feeling of lack of wholeness, lack of completeness, the feeling that you are not sufficient, insufficient for yourself. These are all pathologies. Maybe shame, extreme shame, maybe extreme guilt. There's something there. No healthy person ends with a narcissist. Forget that particular myth. There is a myth online that the narcissists are such amazing actors that they deceived you and you found yourself suddenly discovering the truth Narcissists are very bad actors. You can see and spot a narcissist within less than five seconds. The the way he carries his body, the way he talks, the way he treats taxi drivers and waiters. I mean, there are so many signs. The way he doesn't respect your boundaries. He decides where to go to eat on a first date. On a first date, he decides where to go to eat. He orders the wine. He takes your purse. He tells you what to do, what not to do. Can I ask something? Uh, when it's over, narcissist, it's easier. When it's covered, it's more difficult. But I agree that you can feel after like 10 seconds who is uh, standing next to you. Uh, the covert so, narcissist, yeah. both overt and covert, they're grandiose. Mm-hmm. And it is impossible not, impossible not to notice grandiosity. Mm-hmm. So the overt narcissist is grandiose about himself. Mm-hmm. The covert narcissist would be grandiose about other people. Mm-hmm. So a typical sentence of overt, overt classic narcissist. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm at the top of my profession. I'm making $2 million a year. That's overt mm-hmm. narcissist. Mm-hmm. The covert narcissist will say, I'm very good friends with the overt narcissist who is making $2 million a year. Mm-hmm. He, will, he will redirect the grandiosity, but it will still be grandiosity. It's not true. It's it's a myth. It's a lie. Victims victims generally, survivors and victims generally, have a problem admitting that they had contributed to whatever had happened to them. They want to participate in a morality play of angels and demons, where they are, of course, the angels. This is grandiosity. This is grandiosity. To say that you are impeccable, that you are perfect in anything, even if perfect victim, claim to perfection is grandiosity. These empaths, so-called empaths, and I don't know what, these are people who are in all probability covert narcissists. Mm -hmm. They are aggrandizing their victimhood 
they are transforming their victimhood into something to be proud of. They are, they are converting victimhood into an identity. They are leveraging victimhood to have power over other people. You don't have to believe me. Try to argue with an empath. See the reaction. Okay. The reaction is identical to the reaction of a narcissist. I if try. you try to argue or disagree okay. or, or criticize an empath, so-called, they are sometimes worse than us. They're vicious. So victimhood, victimhood is the most common disguise of the covert narcissist. Mm -hmm. And even classic and overt narcissists, they also sometimes claim that they are victims. Mm -hmm. So, real victims, because there are real victims, of course. Uh, being in a relationship with the narcissist is a battle zone. It's a war. You are a casualty. I'm not denying this. I'm the first who said it. I coined the phrase narcissistic abuse. I'm the father. You're talking to father. I'm the father of the field. You don't need to teach me that narcissists are abusive, that they cause people damage. I told people that narcissists are abusive and they cause damage. They cause damage. You know this because of me. Even if you don't know me, never heard of me, you know all this and you're discussing all this because I came first in 1995. So I don't feel any problem saying what I'm saying. There are real victims out there. Most of them are not online making a display and an exhibition of their suffering, yes? But there are real victims. The thing is that they need to seriously think what went wrong, not with the narcissist and not with the relationship, but with themselves. It's a time for soul searching. It's a time, it's an opportunity to get to know yourself much better. Now, no one guarantees it will not, ha not happen again, but still, the it's an opportunity. It's, it's uh, maybe for the first time in your life, you can really love yourself by getting to know yourself and to throw that away and to say, there's nothing I need to know about myself. I know myself. I'm empathic. I'm good hearted. I'm wonderful. I'm sympathetic. I'm helping people. You see how many people love me? I don't need to. It's him. He's a demon. He's a he's pos his possession. He's a devil. He, I mean, this is religiosity and morality play that are not helping the narcissist. Now, if you go online, 99% of self-styled coaches and self-styled experts, that's precisely what they're doing. They're telling you you're perfect. You, you're blameless. You are guiltless. Things have been done to you. You're a magnet. You couldn't help it. Magnets cannot help it. You know? You are, you know, and now, having told you all this, give me your money. Okay. These are con artists. Narcissistic con artists and victims want to hear this. They gravitate to such videos because they want to hear that they are perfect. Is this not narcissism? It is. That's what the narcissist wants to be told that he is perfect, that he is blameless. Narcissists, exactly like victims, believe that the world envies them, conspires against them. They believe that they are victims. They are paranoid. They believe they are victims of external forces. Narcissists will be the first to tell you, I am as clever as Albert Einstein. Why I'm not famous like Einstein? Not my fault. My boss, my wife, society, the government, the universe, they conspire against me. They envy me. They destroy me. Both victims and narcissists have an external locus of control. The victim's external locus of control is the narcissist. The victim says, everything bad that happened to me was the narcissist's fault. My life was not in my control. He controlled my life 100%. So go to him. Don't talk to me. And the narcissist says, everything that happens to me, everything bad that happens to me is not my fault. It's happening to me from outside. Don't talk to me. Talk to the government, to the CIA, to my boss, to my wife. I'm innocent. Both of them make the claim of innocence. Nothing is worse. Nothing is nothing is the end. There's no bigger enemy of healing than to claim that you're innocent. No one is innocent. There are no saints here. Mm -hmm. I completely agree, especially with this dynamic. And a lot of, uh, like we spoke with the, on the beginning, that a lot of um, people um, speaking about 
black and white, like uh, angel and devil. And it's not about that because when I was in a relationship even with a narcissist, I wasn't angel at all. It's like about dynamic and that's what I trying to um, show uh, on my channel also on YouTube. That's why I'm so grateful for your time, for your knowledge and your wisdom. Thank you so much, uh, Sam. Thank you. Uh, one more I would time. add one so, sentence. I would add one sentence based on what you said. I'll, I'll yeah. try to keep it very brief. When you think about something in black and white, yeah. uh, demon and angel, yeah. I am perfect. Is this is called splitting? It's an infantile defense mechanism. Splitting is pathological. Is sick. Yeah. Is infantile. It's aggressive, and it is characteristic. Characteristic of narcissists and psychopaths. If you are displaying splitting, it is extremely strong indication that you are a narcissist. We are not aware of any other mental health disorder. And we are definitely not aware of any healthy person showing splitting, using splitting. It's unique to narcissists and psychopaths. You split the narcissist, you say he's all bad, I'm all good, he's all black, I'm all white. I have a surprise for you. In all probability, you are a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Completely agree because it's not about black and white, it's not about that and never was. So it was Dr. Sam Bakning, thank you so much. And uh, I'm Daria Zhukovska, clinical psychologist and therapist. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. I stopped recording.